Okay, so we've been looking at these uh, explanations for player pay. By the way, did you guys watch the World Series last night? Oh my, I had to turn it off. It's like 12.30 at night. I'm tired. I'm old. Back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. Anybody rooting for anybody in particular? I hate the designated hitter rule. So it changes the whole nature of the game. The whole nature of the game is everyone plays offense, everyone plays defense. In football, you've got offensive players and defensive players, all right? You got a clock, don't have a clock in baseball. Completely changes the nature of the game. It's just like, oh, yeah. I mean, one of the things that I find interesting about baseball is that it's a sport where you're a 300 hitter, it means you've gotten a hit 30% of the time, 70% of the time you fail, and you're a great hitter. How would that go in football? 30% of your completions. Is that a good quarterback? That guy sucks, right? That's why I, I, it's, it's an interesting sport. I mean, it's just it's completely different, no clock. Defense has the ball. Um, everybody plays offense, everybody plays defense, which you get in the NBA. You get that in basketball, and you'll have that in hockey to a degree, other than the goalie. But all of those have clocks. The offense has the puck. The defense has the ball in basketball, but not baseball. It's completely different. You have to have a winner. You can't have a tie. And then the DH rule just changes all that. It just throws all that stuff to the wind. All right, so let's look at our uh, different models here that we were looking at for uh, explanations for player salary. So last time we had looked at this idea of the uh, monopsony. We want to look at the winner's curse today. All right, and uh, you remember this idea from broadcasting rights when we were saying, okay, the winner's curse was that we don't exactly know how much these rights are worth. What happens if we bid too much and the person that won the rights is actually uh, the loser, right? The person that didn't win the rights to broadcast is the one that's the winner. Well, it could be the same thing here. Because right, we can have players that we pay for um, that maybe we overpay for. And this is especially true with free agency because with free agency, right, you have this idea, of course, that people are brought on. They're stuck at the team for a certain amount of time depending upon the league that you're in, NFL, NBL, M uh, MLB, <coughs> NBA, etc. And then they become a free agent. They can go from team to team. Um, and I've always kind of wondered, it's like if that person was such a great player, why doesn't the team that has them want to retain them? Why are they going to this other team, right? I mean, that's an interesting thing. Interestingly enough, if you can look at the literature, and this has nothing to do with the winner's curse, oh, I guess to a degree it does. You can look at the literature and you can find out that the team that has the player has, knows more about their physical ailments than the team that they're going to, which is probably pretty obvious, right? I mean, that, that should be an obvious thing, that the people that are there with you know you're the guy, hey, he's complaining about his back a whole lot. Well, he's not going to say that when he's going to the other team, et cetera. But, uh, so let's look at some examples here. We've got Joe Montana. And, uh, of course, from 1979 to 92, he was in San Francisco. 93 to 94, he was in Kansas City. I don't know if you guys even remember this. You probably don't. But let's look at his games here. So here's his games in San Francisco. Here's his games in Kansas City. 167 and 25. His completions, 29, 29, 480. His attempts. 
4,600, 791. So his percentage for completion here, 63.7, 60.7. Number of yards, 35,124, 54, 27 yards per attempt, 7.6, 6.8, touchdowns, 244, 29 interceptions, 123, 16. Uh, let's do the rushing as well. So here's his rushing attempts. 414, 43 rushing yards. 1595, 81. Touchdowns, 20, 0. Average rating, 126.6, one, 110.5. Right, so it went down fairly significantly. Um, <clears throat> so if we look at him basically kind of like before, and after the trade, yards per game. Do I have yards per game on here? I do not. So let's look at this just right before. So here's his all times. Right? Here's right before, right after. Season before, season after. Yards per attempt, 7.6, 6.8. Yards per game, 210, 217. Uh, passing, yeah. Let's just do, let's do some of these. Yeah, let's just ignore that. That's, that's getting too deep into that's getting too much into the woods. Here we see this guy, right? 1979, 89, 90, 91, 92, 13 years. It's a long time in football, right? His last two seasons here at Kansas City. And let's look at this here, 1990. Making 13 million, four year deal. With the 49ers, right? So on average, this of course is about 3.25 million per year. When you think about it, actually not that much money, right? Even for the 90s. 93-94, for the Chiefs, he's averaging 3.5 million per year. So he actually has a better deal, all right, going to Kansas City. And let's kind of see what happens here. In 91, 92, 93, 94, and I think I got 95 on here as well, all right? So 91, they go 6.25. Second place in the division, 92.625. Second place, 93.688. Won the division. Everybody was very, very excited. 94.563, second place, 95 is 813, won the division, 
I think that was the first year that they had, uh, not Romo, um, what was the guy's name? Can't remember his name now. <clears throat> so we ask ourselves, right, this winner take all kind of approach says basically, you know, we're going to hire these players and they're good. But there might be this winner's curse. And we can ask ourselves, was Joe Montana actually a good buy? Right? I mean, so here's kind of what he did in Kansas City. All right, so his uh, completion percentage is a little down. His yards per attempt is down. His interceptions are way up, right? 29 touchdowns, 16 interceptions. If you look at this on a, well, actually not that much, maybe 244 to 123. Um, 81 rushing yards. That's not very surprising. The guy's getting pretty old. He doesn't want to run anymore. Right. But you can see here the average rating's gone down for the guy, and we're actually paying more for him, paying $3.5 million per year than $3.25 million per year. So you can ask yourself, well, was the guy a good buy or not? I don't know. But there was the standing joke in Kansas City in, oh, I don't know, late 93, early 94. Why is a dollar better than Joe Montana. You can get four quarters for a dollar. Right? The idea being that, in essence, I mean, the guy was, he'd have to come out a lot of the time. Which shouldn't be surprising, right? The guy's getting pretty old. So you kind of have this winner's curse. Maybe it's something where, you know, people play, uh, we buy them, and they're not that great because the San Francisco 49ers have more information about Joe Montana's health than the Kansas City Chiefs do. Speaking of which, when he decided to retire, do you know what he did? He got on a plane and flew to San Francisco and announced his retirement while he was still playing with the Chiefs. That was kind of a crappy thing to do, I think. But whatever. And we got another explanation. Not the winner's curse, but the winner take all. Usually, this applies to individual sports, right? Such as golf and tennis. So you got these things like TV, the internet, etc. Allows fans to watch. But you can basically, you can't watch everybody, right? Uh, it's difficult to watch every single person that's playing in the golf tournament. It's every, difficult to watch every single person that's playing at the U.S. Open. I mean, I guess you can, but basically, uh, you kind of really only kind of watch basically, um, I don't want to put this major players, I'll put, just put it that way. Okay. So you have an incentive here. Uh, well, let me put it this way. Let's assume you got 10 golf tournaments. And you have 10 players. How can you keep people from cheating? In other words, you've got these 10 players. Player one could say, okay, I'm going to win this tournament, and I agree that player B, we all agree that player B will win the next one. We agree that player C will win the next one. We agree that player D will win the next one, E, F, etc. How do you keep that from happening?
One way to do that is to have, essentially, really, to a degree, the winner takes all. So when you look at the play out, I mean, when you look at the earnings here, So this is for the, all right, here's a typical prize money. For a master's tournament. Here's your typical one. First place gets one point one million two hundred and sixty thousand. Right? These are all going to be in thousands. Second place, seven fifty six. Third place, four seventy six. Fourth place, three thirty six. Uh, let's come down here to tenth place. 189, 11 is 175, 20th place, 91,000, 21st place, 84, 30th place, 47,600. 47, 20.3. Oftentimes, how much will players differ in strokes between, I don't know, 10 and 11, 11 and 12? One stroke, maybe zero. Half the time they tie a lot of the times, right? One person wins and you got a tie for two, three, four, five, and six, something of that nature. You can see here that you have this incentive, right? I mean, going from 21 to 20 gets you an extra uh, 7,000. Not a lot of money, but I mean, it's seven thousand bucks. Seven thousand bucks. One place here, though, seven fifty-six minus twelve, two sixty. Uh, two hundred and fifty. Um, a little more, a little less than, a, a little more than a quarter million. I mean, half a million dollars, right? So here, one place below, not that big of a deal. Here, one place below. A huge deal, $500,000. Okay, let's all agree to this. Player A will win the first tournament. Player B wins the second. Player C wins the third. Player D wins the first. And let's assume that they all agree to that. A wins. Because B, C, D, E, and F screw up their shots. How do you ensure that A is not going to cheat them in the next round? You see what I'm saying? The next tournament, how do you know that A is not going to be, okay, it's B's turn this time. Well, and this is that game theory stuff, right? How do you know that the person's going to keep their agreement? You don't. Because if A cheats on the agreement and plays and wins, he goes from, say, right, let's assume it's A's turn to be the, the second player. If he cheats, he gets $500,000. That's a pretty strong incentive to cheat. So you remember things like the Gini coefficient when you're looking at winnings in sports, right? We want an idea of how much inequity there is. Uh, 
right, for golf and tennis here, these guys can range for uh, men's golf. This guy is 0.656. All right. I don't have the one here for tennis. I thought I did. It's also pretty high. Remember, for the U.S., this guy was like between three and four, depending upon how you measure income. Are you measuring income with all of the welfare benefits that you get, minus all of the taxes that you pay? Is it kind of pre-tax? Is it post-tax? Is it pre-benefits? Is it post-benefits? Depending upon how you want to measure income in the U.S., it's between 0.3 to 0.4. It's not a very, it's not a simple way to measure income. But in men's golf, it's twice as high almost. Last one here is discrimination in pay and hiring. So here we're going to have pay being different for different people. But remember, marginal revenue product, which is equal to the wage, is marginal product times marginal revenue. So you have two different things here that could affect the wage. It could be both marginal product and marginal revenue. Right? So let's look at what impacts marginal product. We've got some things like innate ability. Basically, some people are just better at sports than others. And some people are better at some sports than other sports. <coughs> Statistically speaking, which of these two people is going to be the better baseball or the better uh, basketball player? The seven foot tall guy or the five foot 11 inch tall guy? The seven foot, right? Statistically speaking, right? So let's look at a couple of people here. You've got um, Yao Ming. He played with the Rockets. And you've got this guy by the name of Earl Boykins. Five feet, five inches. He played with the Bobcats out of Charlotte. The guy was five feet, five inches tall and in the NBA. That's pretty good, right? Let's look at how they did. So we've got points per game, rebounds per game, uh, assists per game, steals per game, Blocks per game, field goal percentage, free throw percentage, three point percentage. All right, so I've got uh, Boykins. Got Ming, the guy, the guys from China. Nine point four, nineteen. Okay. 1 1.4, 9.2, 3.4, and 0.6. 0.6, 0.4. 0 on average, 1.8. Uh, 41%, 52%. Eighty-seven percent, 
82%, 34 percent, 11 percent. So, I mean, clearly in almost all of these metrics, Yao Ming, the seven foot six inch China guy, is better than Earl Boykins, the five foot five inch guy, right? It's, it's got two feet on him, two feet and an inch. It's not that people that five feet five inches can't play basketball. The guy could beat me, clearly. I don't, I'm not very good at basketball. But statistically speaking, who's got more innate ability? Well, it's going to be the tall guy. But ability, the innate ability here is not enough, right? You have to be trained. So I'm sure you guys have heard your coach use the words muscle memory. What does that mean? Exactly. You've done that thing again and again and again and again and again, right? It becomes second nature. You don't even have to think about how to do this, how to catch this ball, how to throw the pass, how to do whatever. I mean, it's just second nature. You've done it again and again and again and again and again. All right? So part of being a good player, part of this kind of muscle memory is the training. But what happens if they say, we're not going to give you a lot of training because we don't think that you have the ability? Yeah, you can have what is called... Uh, let's see, I've got it in here, uh, statistical, discrimination. So statistical discrimination says we've got these players here, we're not going to give them very much training, therefore they're not going to perform well. And because players like that don't perform well, we're not going to give them a lot of training. There's no point in putting training into them if they're not going to perform well. It becomes basically self-reinforcing. So the idea used to be blacks don't do well in football, no training, and then sure enough, they wouldn't do well in football. And they would say, sure, see, blacks can't play football, so there's no point in hiring them. They were using, in essence, statistical discrimination. So that's the marginal product side. The other side's the marginal revenue side. So the marginal product side is here based upon kind of like ability of the player, statistical discrimination, how much training we're going to give them, et cetera. Where does the marginal revenue side come from? Who determines the marginal revenue? Not the firm. It's the fans. This is from the fans.
So you can have fan preference. Reducing pay. And it's reducing pay because it's reducing revenue. People's willingness to pay, right? People's willingness to pay is reduced. There's going to be less revenue. There's going to be less pay for the players. They just don't want to watch that. The National Women's Football Association. This is a league the National Women's Football Association. If you want to be an owner in the National Women's Football Association, $35,000 to join, and you could be a team owner. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 of us $2,000 each, it's 34. They'll give us a break because we're all coming in as one giant consortium. So we could form our consortium. We could form the Eco 316 consortium and we could own our own National Women's Football Association. We'll design our own jerseys. We'll come up with our own team name. We could call ourselves the whatever. And now we own a football team. How much does it cost to join the uh, NFL? A whole lot more than $35,000. Why only $35,000 to join? There's no money in it. Nobody wants to see National Women's Football Association games. Why? They're more interested in something else. They don't want to watch it. So how much do the women that are playing in this league get paid? They don't get paid anything. They get paid nothing. Let's look at the WNBA. The average salary here Fifty-five thousand NBA average salary four point nine million. Why? Yeah, fans for some reason, whatever that reason is, have said, "I don't want to watch women's basketball. I would rather watch men's basketball." And so there is a fan preference for. Men's basketball. That's why men NBA players are making $5 million a year. Women basketball players are barely able to cover the rent. $55,000 sounds like a lot to a college student, but in a real job, $55,000 is not that much money. Especially if you consider all the travel that you have to do and all of the work that it takes to do that. It's not that much money. So what does this look like, right? Here's our quantity. Of athletic services and here's our price. Right. Here's our actual marginal revenue product.
Here's our marginal revenue product plus our race premium. Here's our supply. Now I hope you guys understand that you can look at discrimination in two different ways. You've got person A, you've got person B. You can look at it as, let's assume that person A is making more money. You can look at it as A has a premium or you can look at it B has essentially a loss, right? It's the same thing. It's all relative. It's relative spending. So you could look at the actual marginal revenue per product. So this could be the actual marginal revenue product for women's basketball and for men's basketball is here. It could be there for both, right? But what you could say is that there's a marginal revenue product plus a sex premium for men's basketball. Actual marginal revenue product for white baseball players and black baseball players. Negro League, National League. But a race premium here for white players or vice versa. White basketball players, or white basketball players, black basketball players are both here a race premium for black basketball players. It could be either way. It can do, it can do anything it wants to do. Basically, there's this premium here, all right? So we have here, I'm going to call this guy SA, call this guy WA, I'm going to call this guy SB. We're going to call this guy WB, all right? And if we look at this guy, we've got these two different players. They're both identical, all right, in their ability to play. But one has this higher marginal revenue product. Right? And once again, this is relative to the other player. So we have these excess funds that we're paying for this person right here. So this guy here in blue is our excess. Excess dollars for same level of winning, right? Because we're not saying it's based upon marginal product. We're saying it's based upon marginal <coughs> revenue. So let's think about what this guy says. White baseball player, black base, bas, uh, baseball player. Let's assume there's a race premium for white players. People are more willing to pay to see a white baseball player than a black baseball player. Okay. They're both going to perform at the same level. But you can either A, pay the white player more or play the B player less. doesn't matter. It's the same thing. You can call it a race premium or you can call it a race loss. It doesn't matter. It's the same now thing. It's relative. You're getting the same amount of winning from both players, but what are you doing by hiring the white player? You're paying more for it because that's what you've got to pay this player. You're paying the white player, WB, you're paying the black player WA for the same level of winning. So fans here are saying they're actually overpaying for the level of winning. Alternatively, you could have the same level of winning and lower ticket prices. If 
they didn't have a preference for white players or black players or for women basketball players or men basketball players or for tall people versus short people, whatever it is. It can be anything. It can be anything that you want it to be. So this is an interesting guy. I mean, how much of this actually still exists in sports? I don't know. Good 590 topic if you're interested in 590 stuff. Okay, here's the take home portion for the test. I'm gonna have this guy on uh, Wednesday.